We all want more streams on Spotify, right? Well, what if I told you there is a way to game the system so that you get more streams? Let's talk about that today. Welcome to episode six of Behind the Band, a podcast where we are all about helping you grow your music career by talking with awesome artists and people from the industry. Hey, my name is David Ryan Olson, and I run Evergreen Records, where we're all about helping artists like you grow. And I'm excited that you've decided to join me today. Before we jump in, just wanted to let you know that if you are releasing music in the future, I would love for you to check out our free workshop, Rock the Release. It's going to go into more detail about some of the stuff we're talking about today. We're going to teach you a proven plan for promoting your music for maximum success. We're talking about getting on playlists and blogs and shared by influencers. So I'm going to walk you through how to do that. So if that sounds good, just go to evergreenrecords.com slash workshop to sign up for Rock the Release. So today we have Mark Eckert joining us, and this guy is very, very plugged in with where the music industry is going. So I had him come on to talk about what is going on with services like Spotify and Apple Music. How are their playlists being curated? What is changing and what you can do as an artist to ensure success in this new paradigm of streaming services. So without further ado, let's jump in to my conversation with Mark Ecker. All right, guys, here is the one and only Mark Eckert. How are you doing today, dude? What's up, guys? What's up, buddy? <laughs> the one and only, bro. The one and only. You could tell that to the guy who uh, owned my domain, markeckert.com, for like the past 10 years, and I just bought it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like uh, like two months ago or something, went on went on GoDaddy's uh, auction. So made that happen. Pretty stoked. So now I am officially the one and only, except for Mark Eckert in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. So sorry, well, bro. He's probably not listening, so we can <laughs> forget about him. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, it was a decade struggle. Anyways, how are you doing, dude? I'm doing good. We're just uh, still trucking along on uh, on quarantine, trying to still stay sane, make some music all that. Yeah. So funny thing. So I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's funny. Everything was very, very chill. Nobody in Charlotte really expected it to come to Charlotte for some reason. It's like, oh, it's in a different state. Well, literally within a day, the whole city just shut down. (laughs) Like all my friends were like, yeah, like I don't have any gigs anymore or whatever's going on. Um, So literally within a day, which has been absolutely nuts, man. Everybody has had that experience of just like overnight. It's like the industry has just been like flipped upside down. I feel like this sort of thing happens to the music industry every couple of years. Like (laughs) there's something that happens where everybody is completely out of work or something like that. You know, I remember when YouTube got big and everybody who was doing live shows was freaking out because they thought people wouldn't go to concerts anymore. (laughs) You know, Um, and then streaming happens and all of a sudden there's no CDs. But like at the end of the day, you know, we're in an industry where everything just changes uh, every couple of years. And like, that's totally okay As long as you go into it with that expectation that, you know, shit's going to hit the fan every three to four years and you are financially prepped for that. And you're always thinking of how can I evolve my you know, my business strategy or what my offers are, or what I do, you'll be fine. But if you get super comfortable and you think nothing's going to change and you just have your bar gig and that's all you have going, eventually something's going to happen. Yeah. Last couple episodes and the episodes I've got coming out in the future is just talking about, well, while the industry has turned on its head, how do we learn how to adapt and what are things that we can control sure. right now? So one of the reasons why I wanted to bring you on the show was just to talk about, well, what are we looking at in terms of streaming and all of that kind of behind the scenes stuff? But before we jump into that, we'd just love to get to know you a little bit. Tell us your story. Oh man, walks on the beach sort of thing. That's that's what we're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a wild ride, bro. I grew up, um, so I moved, I moved a bunch growing up, lived in the States, lived overseas, ended up um, going to high school in, in Charlotte. I, uh, 
you know, got super into music, I don't know, since I was like a little kid, because my mom, she was a pianist and songwriter full time. When I was like a teen, she taught piano out of our house. And like, kind of looking back, it's really funny because, um, you know, I'm self-employed in music and like, I, I run a couple different businesses within that. And, you know, I basically have just, uh, like any nice Jewish boy, I've turned into my mother. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, she was just an absolute hustler teaching piano uh, for clients out of our house. So, I mean, she built a private teaching piano business out of literally an alcove in our house to like an 80 to 90K a year business. Yeah, so I ended up uh, going to Berkeley in Boston, um, went for a year. Um, Dropped out like, you know, 90% of people who go to Berkeley <laughs> went there for drums uh, and producing a little bit. I uh, ended up moving to New York, was there for a little bit. I was playing. I was, you know, just trying to figure some shit out. Uh, and then I ended up moving back down to Charlotte um, and just started kind of building the business here. Um, through producing, uh, I was playing with a couple different artists, um, you know, drumming and MDing, and then uh, started kind of getting more into sync licensing a few years ago. Yeah, it's been it's been really cool, man. I want to read the headline from your website just to give people a little bit of context. It's kind of an infamous headline, <laughs> and it says, "All I give a shit about is producing and developing indie pop artists." That and dogs. Yeah, <laughs> I mean that's good. You should add that. Just you know, <laughs> you mentioned a little bit about doing the production side. Most of us probably have a good idea of what producing artists entails, but what does developing an artist entail? Yeah, so it can mean a number of things. So the whole thing with development is that everybody's at a different stage in not only their artistic journey, but in their career, you know? I think there's like this weird thing going around right now where a lot of people are spewing production as like, a, I'm going to build your career sort of thing. Whereas if there's more of a holistic approach of like, Hey, like this is not an overnight thing. I'm not going to make you graphics and, you know, just kind of like run a Facebook campaign and see if we can get some fans to your Spotify, you know what I'm saying? Like if we can really build something where you have, it's called a fanocracy. I recently learned that term and I, I love it where you're able to very simply state what your story is you're able to communicate that through your sound and what your messaging is. Um, you have something consistent that a lot of people can rely on and you have people that resonate with you and would, you know, fucking kill for you. Um, and that that takes a lot of work. It can take, you know, um, sometimes a couple steps where, you know, it's really just more about finding the sound and you already have a fan base. Like for instance, um, TikTok influencer I've worked with, you know, she's got like a quarter million on TikTok, but, you know, she didn't really have uh, a product out. Like she didn't have like a song out that uh, she was willing to promote to her audience, you know? And I had to figure out, okay, like how can we help you with that sort of and figure out what your likes are, what your dislikes are? How can we kind of just like get the missing piece here? Uh, and then there's other people where their sound is totally put together and they have no idea how the fuck to talk to people. <laughs> like, how, <laughs> like, you know, like how do we, how do we get people to care about your story? It's not hard to get people to like you or to hate you. It's really hard to get people to care at all. Fact of the matter is, is like everybody's at a different place. I have a very specific kind of artist that I, that I work with that I think I can really help. If I don't feel like I can help them, then I just, you know, give them the phone number to somebody I think could help them. So it's, it's kind of, you have to find people where they're at. Like the way I always explain it, uh, anytime I talk to a new artist and we're thinking about maybe working together is like, I'm going to ask you a half hour to an hour worth of questions. And I'm just going to take a shit ton of notes. But the way that I try to word it is like, listen, you're coming to me because you have a problem, right? And if you go to a doctor and you don't tell them anything and they just put you on morphine, like, did they really fix anything? <laughs> you know? Right. You got to figure out what somebody's problems are before you can diagnose them and then maybe offer a solution. Um, and if you can't offer that solution you send them to a different doctor or you tell them like what next steps are. So the, the whole point is like my mom really and my dad 
were very adamant, specifically in the music industry, never accept a dollar unless you can help somebody. And if you can't help them, absolutely refuse it. Like it doesn't matter. Like you can't get your rent figured out or whatever. Like don't accept money unless you know that you can actually help that person. Yeah. Everybody's at a different point. So it's like developing them, like figuring out what they're reasonably trying to accomplish within a certain amount of time. And like, how can we get you there? It's almost like you are acting as an artist's business coach to a certain extent. Yeah, but I'm also producing them. So it's like this weird thing. I'm just kind of like, (laughs) I'm just like this strange big brother that I'm just like, hey, bro, or hey, sis, like we should do that. Oh, you can't do that. Okay, then let's do these things instead. It's like I'm almost like a label for hire. Well, okay. So I think one of the things that goes along really well with the fact that you help develop your artists is that you provide a lot of resources to help artists as they are navigating some really key parts of their journey. Like you give away uh, resources talking about, okay, you're releasing a song. What the hell do you do? Sure. If you go to um, markeckert.com, I have a bunch of free resources for artists and producers and I have this thing, um, it's a 33 page book that I wrote called release strategy. And it literally goes into detail how like actual, like badass PR agents do it. And you'll figure out there's no secret to us, but like there is an absolute methodology and a process of which they do it. And I know this is how they do it because I paid thousands of dollars for consultations to figure out how they do it, you know, figured out a, a standard. So I have another thing called performing live, which basically tells you how to run backing tracks, I have a free download for 100 Spotify playlisters. The release strategy ebook is because I had an artist call me up crying her eyes out because she spent thousands of dollars on a PR campaign that went nowhere. I, you know, like I told you, kind of like that big brother sort of thing. You don't want to see somebody you care about, like, go through that. I took off like about a month and a half and literally was like, I need to make sure this never happens again to any artist I work with. I gave it to all the artists I worked with. We had some results and I was like, fuck it. Like this should just be free for everybody. I highly recommend going and downloading release strategy. If you're an artist looking to start promoting your releases better, would you be willing Mark just to kind of breeze over like some of the stuff you talk about in that book? So I break it down into a couple different sections within the books. Uh, If I remember correctly, basically it's, kind of like the methodology behind it. I think I called it mindset or whatever. Kind of just like how PR agents are approaching this, what they're thinking, basically the materials that you need, and then the playbook. So it's basically like, all right, well, here is how you should approach it. Here is all the stuff, you know, combined that you would need. You know, here is the step by step. All right, email these people. You know, if they don't respond, follow up with this message, like this exact message. If they don't respond there, one more message. If they don't respond at all, don't do it again because you'll get blocked off. Like they, they will mark you as spam. I have this whole schedule of when you should email people for blog premieres um, versus when you should start reaching out to Spotify playlisters, independent playlisters primarily, you know, kind of going a little bit into Spotify's algorithm uh, just a touch. So maybe give us just like a quick timeline of what does that kind of look like? There's basically a six week timeline. The first three weeks are before you put out the song, like it's before the release date. And those three weeks are primarily to get a premiere. A premiere is a publication um, that talks about your song first. I've heard people say, why do I care about a, a premiere on a music blog or a magazine? No one reads that. Machine learning. If you give a shit at all about Spotify or Apple Music or Deezer or Pandora or whatever, um, you want write-ups. Basically, Spotify wants to replace the vast majority of their curation with AI. They need a shit ton of data from your song. And the way that they can garner that is through raw data through the actual song. So they'll say, oh, you know, um, I have like this synth pop crazy, you know, thing going on. That sounds similar to Passion Pit or St. Lucia. So me being Spotify, I'm the Spotify algorithm talking, do to do. So I'm going to find a bunch of listeners that re- that resonate, a bunch of different accounts that resonate with these specific artists. And I'm going to experiment by pushing this song to, let's say, Discovery or similar playlists that might be suggested to those users. Um, and if they, if these users you know, engage with that song um, and keep engaging with that song, it'll view it as 
good material. And then it'll have reason to believe that more people will enjoy it. So then they share it. The same thing can be said for Facebook posts or Instagram posts that go viral. You know, the same thing can be Tinder of, you know, if you keep swiping right for somebody uh, and, you know, I don't know, they're, they all have brown hair. Well, maybe like you'll get a bunch of brunettes like <laughs> being sent to you because uh, it'll notice that that's what you like or whatever. Um, every song has a DNA and that's how Spotify looks at it. So another thing that is huge is for external sources. So if you have a write up in Pitchfork or Billboard or even something smaller, you know, an artist that I work with um, in Columbia, South Carolina, he just texted me and he got a write up on Aesthetic Mag Toronto. Well, these different blogs and different write-ups can add tremendous value to your song's DNA, uh, to your artist DNA. Um, and it will start putting that into account um, when suggesting your song to other people, etc. So it's tremendously important to get uh, people to look at your stuff on blogs or just to get write-ups in general. It's a lot, I know, but like that, <laughs> yeah. it's it's incredibly important. Um, the book breaks this down into like just easy bite pieces or whatever the hell that term is. Like, you know, like it's it sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. Um, there's a simple schedule to follow. Again, it's free. You know, reach out to these people at this time. Cool. Then reach out to people at this time. If they say yes, then email everybody else this other thing. Let's keep plugging away on like what this timeline is that you've laid out. You're talking about three weeks before you've submitted Spotify for artists, you've reached out to blogs. What else are you doing during that time? Yeah, so the, the first three weeks is mainly for the premiere. You want a premiere. Um, that's going to set a precedent for other blogs and other playlisters that pick up your stuff. A premiere is basically an exclusive write-up that goes out the day before you release your song publicly. And then the three weeks after that, you want obviously more write-ups um, talking about you know your story, et cetera. And then that's when you start reaching out to primarily independent playlisters um, to garner traction and get a lot of people listening uh, relatively quickly. So it's basically like the first three is getting a premiere, the second three is getting uh, additional write-ups and then getting playlists. Thing is, it's not that crazy. That's why I was like, why is this secret? And people are paying $5,000 to do this with one single, <laughs> you know? I've just talked to so many artists that are like, well, I get it uploaded to my distributor, gets on Spotify, I hit submit for playlist consideration, I fill out the form. During that time leading up to it, I've uploaded it to Submit Hub. I'm like doing the whole premium credit thing. You know, why aren't I getting any traction on the song? Yeah, so... A lot of people will talk weird about Submit Hub, but Submit Hub's dope. They're great, and they offer more opportunity to really hundreds of thousands of artists that wouldn't either ha that like wouldn't have it otherwise. Uh, by the way, you can go ahead and email each one of these blogs on your own. Um, they just make it way simpler to you. It's just a platform. That's really it. Um, the contacts aren't secret. It's just they make it easy. So you're paying for convenience. Um, so it's not Submit Hub's fault if you don't land something. The fact of the matter is, is like you have to look at the business model of a blog, of a journalist, etc. So, like, how is your story helping their publication? Okay, it really comes down to economics to a degree. You need to be right, be providing a, a lot of value to their publication. So, there's an artist in Raleigh. A big thing for them is that they're avid runners. You know, their music's dope, but what made me want to work with them is like they are avid runners and they have hosted like their own half marathon things, um, their own runs and stuff like that. They're of like their own events. They've hosted events at breweries that are sponsoring these events. And they were a little bit shy about that. And I was like, you guys do not understand that you would be the only write up in a running magazine for music in every one of those motherfuckers are going to get behind you because instead of saying, Hey, you're a fan, it's like, no, we're runners. And then they're going to all uplift you. Once you break into a niche, you can break in anywhere else. So that's why I took them on. They're dope. They're wonderful people. The music's great, but I took them on. Cause I was like, Oh shit, easily they can blow up. You have to figure out your story and like how that's going to help a publication. They're going to help a runner's publication because what other 
artist is reaching out saying, Hey, we're runners first, you know, <laughs> like this is our thing. Um, and we want to share this with the community and really uplift the community. If there's something outside of music, a story or something, Passion Pit, Michelangelakis struggle, struggles with bipolar disorder. There's a lot of mental health magazines and a lot of people who struggle with depression and, and anxiety got obsessed with that. You know, I struggled with crazy anxiety and depression back in high school. And that's when I discovered that record. And I was like, oh, this guy has the same story as me. So you have to find a medium in which you provide value that you can share a story with somebody who would resonate with you. You're almost saying you don't even necessarily need to be going after the Rolling Stones and the Pitchforks. No. You just need to get someone to help you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And also those big ones, 999 times out of 1,000, you don't offer them any value. By the time they cover something, for the most part, that shit is so vetted, they're going to get clicks. A lot of times, these big, these big blogs, uh, my buddy Dane, he works at uh, Condé Nast, who has Pitchfork. And he tells me they are constantly looking at smaller publications. They want to see what's sticking. That's their market analysis. They are looking at what people are giving a shit about. And if enough people give a shit about them, that gives them you know, an ability to say, okay, you know what? I think we could take a, a reasonable chance on this. We've, we've thought about it. I think this might work. And that's when they take a chance, but they're not going to go blind over something. Uh, every time they've gone blind over something for one of my friends, it wasn't blind. They knew that person for like 10 years, like foreign air. They got uh, a, co- a huge um, cover in I think it was billboard or pitchfork, basically like front page, completely new band. And everyone was like, how did you get that? Well, it's because the journalist was like a huge fan of Jesse, the singer's old band, Harvard, for like 10 years. And they had uh, an article drop and they were like, hey, we need something here. I got a spot. Do you want to fill it? And he was like, yeah. Literally, they picked a band name <laughs> within a day. <laughs> Song wasn't even out. And within a couple of weeks, like, you know, they were opening for bleachers and Fanagram and shit like that. You have to think of like both from like a business perspective Like, you know, you said the economics of it, but also like you don't, you never know like when a relationship is going to like, you never know, like actually return a dividend. Yeah. And that's the thing. It's like, you know, become friends with literally everybody, not like to use people, but like, you know, at the end of the day, one in a thousand people in general do something really cool with their life. You know, you have to plant a thousand seeds in order for like one or two of them to grow. And that. Like that is not the default process if you don't know what you're doing. That is the standard process in the industry. The machine that these artists are run through, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. I worked on the intro for um, H.D. Ben Black, who um, he's with Rock Nation. He's a newer artist, um, and he, but he's with Rock Nation, and they're trying to push him. Just because you're like signed doesn't mean you're just gonna blow up overnight. Gavin Haley, I worked on a record. Uh, worked on one of his singles and uh, he's with Red Bull and you know, he's not a household name yet. These huge companies are also reaching out and seeing where everything is sticking. That's it. They just have a team. It's the only difference. You're trying to reinforce the fact that you don't need a label. Fuck and in no. fact, that's not, that's not a magic bullet to success. I think so, for so long, there's been this like myth and it's like remnant of the old days where it's like, okay, the point of starting a band or launching a project as, as like a singer songwriter or whatever is like, okay, you're just going to grind locally for a while and then magically you're going to get discovered and then someone's going to hand you a huge multi-million dollar record deal and then it'll be great. That is not the goal anymore. That's not what success looks like. No. So success nowadays looks like are you connecting with people (laughs) are you releasing music yeah are you getting to do what you love every day that's literally it i mean like you got to realize like in our industry there's gonna there's always no matter what you do there's gonna be the old guard and that's okay that's totally fine like you shouldn't expect an invitation in if you can't provide any more value than somebody else like why should you have prioritization over somebody who worked their ass off for 30 years for that position, you know? But because all these really, really badass people at the top in the old guard or whatever are so comfortable, like, what are they forgetting about? 
what is not worth their time with being an independent artist. It's not a bad idea to focus where nobody else is looking like host. If everybody's focusing online, like once the COVID's over and everything, like host a monthly party and do a back end deal with the bar. So you get a cut of the bar sales, you know, like these are things that, you know, my buddy a Huff and Jay are doing in Charlotte, you know, they have this thing called player made every single month. It's an ode to Southern hip hop. They play ludicrous and the baby and shit like that. But a Huff and Jay, like they, they headline it every single month. It's a headline show for them, but it's a free party. It's called free as fuck. And they literally <laughs> put that on flyers free as fuck, but they do a split with the bar sales. They make a killing and it's for the community. So like, look where nobody else is looking. That's where all the opportunity is, especially in our industry. The fact of the matter is, is like everybody's trying to get into opportunities that are already sold. This is 2020. You can create all of your own opportunities. There's nothing wrong with that. I think some people think that it's a, um, you're kind of giving up if you start like hosting your own thing or you have your own thing, but how is that giving up? Like, like it's better now. Like you can learn everything that a label's doing and have a profitable business. Like, you know, are you going to have a mansion? No, but that takes years for everybody. I, I'd never want a mansion. I think it's like, I'd rather just travel more, <laughs> like, but you fit, <laughs> you figure out your priorities and you can, you can invest yourself in those places. You know, you don't need somebody to say, Hey, you're good enough. Like you can tell yourself you're good enough and just go. You sent out an email <laughs> series starting last week that really intrigued me. Uh, and it said in the headline of your first email, robots are taking over the world, including the music industry. <laughs> Tell us more about what's going on. What's changing in the music industry is what's changing in other industries. The music industry is finally adjacent to an industry that is adapting quick. If you look back in the day, the music industry was adjacent to the film industry, maybe kind of advertising industry, both of which don't really innovate that often. Well, a couple of years ago, Netflix and Spotify happened. So now everybody has to adapt as quickly as possible. So the main things that are changing is what's changing in tech everywhere. Basically, tech companies, whether it be Spotify or tech companies being Netflix or anything, they're trying to figure out how they can build a huge platform where they have a lock on the market and things are done really, really fucking efficiently. So Spotify has a problem. Artists upload 40,000 something or whatever songs a day. Okay. How many songs could you reasonably listen to a day? I will go crazy after a couple hours, just listening straight and sorting things. Spotify is the same way. So they have to figure out how to understandably become like the most popular streaming app without having to hire thousands and thousands and thousands of people to curate songs. So at the same time, make it more valuable and like a better experience for their listener. So yeah, they are implementing a shit ton of tech. They are trying to figure out how to replace people curating songs. We've all been on Facebook and, you know, people talk about Spotify and there's people who champion it. And then there's this one old dude who's pissed about how like nobody's buying his CDs anymore and streaming sucks. And he's going to, you know, be part of the resistance to get everybody to take their music off of Spotify, which will never happen. The best choice is to learn how uh, the second email that I sent is making Spotify your little bitch. So that's the whole point. You have to learn to work with what is evolving. If you don't do that in the music industry, you'll be left behind. So you have to figure out how to work with the algorithm. So main points is you need to put a shit ton of music out. At the end of the day, not only is it about the song or the artist or how much each song is engaging with somebody. It's also about how big your discography is. If you're familiar with the rapper Russ, who's a badass, owns 100% equity in what he does, fucking badass, <laughs> that dude understands negotiation and leverage, he has hundreds of songs out, okay? He said this in an interview, actually recently, when somebody goes to his channel on Spotify 
his artist page, excuse me. They have no choice but to become a fan. He's got a couple hundred songs to listen to. You know, they go to his page. It's just going to keep playing and keep playing. (laughs) And Spotify is going to look at that and be like, think about the couple hundred or thousands of people that just clicked on his page and were just like studying or working or just fucking forgot that Spotify was playing and their, their Mac was on mute. It never switched to radio mode where it started playing random artists. Yeah. He's just racking up streams. He's racking up streams and he's racking up a prioritization in that algorithm. The algorithm changes daily. If it's anything like Instagram, it changes like on a daily basis because it, the machine is constantly learning. So you got to put out music pretty often. So what does that mean? Fucking let go of perfection fucking systemize what you do fucking stop caring about what everybody's going to think when you put out a song because frankly a lot of songs that you probably put out in the past barely got plays anyways so systemize to a degree how you're producing what you write you can self-produce i'm i'm i make my living off of producing i'm telling you learn how to self-produce and put out your own music good god stop hiring me for every single song you don't need to You don't learn how to do it. Get it to 80%. Put it out. You could always do a re-release with like a better version or whatever. If you're really that picky, but put out songs, give people an ability to connect with you. You don't put out anything. You're not even giving a chance for somebody to like you from afar, put out stuff often and stop caring about like what people are going to think of it. They're probably going to think it's dope. You don't want every single fan to like, or every single listener to like you. You want a very particular set of people that obsess over you. That means putting out a lot of music often, giving Spotify as much data as possible, and let it run its algorithm using your stuff. Give people as many chances to like you as possible. Yeah, that is that is probably going to sum up that one email better than I should just film this and send that out instead. <laughs> Why am I writing things, bro? Let's just podcast every day. That'll be my email. Dude, I am so down. <laughs> Um, I know I'm thrown out a lot, but like at the base core, get your music to 80%, put it out, do it every couple days. If you can't do it every couple days, do it once a month. If you can't do it every month, do it every two months. There's no excuse not to put out a song every two months. Get on a distro kid plan and it's 20. you can upload once a week. Yeah. It's 20 bucks a year. What an investment. Unlimited <laughs> uploads. Yeah. Phil Kaplan, the dude who owns that G what a nice guy. Part of the game for Spotify's algorithm isn't necessarily needing to land the big, big playlists. No. It's about getting on a handful of smaller playlists to give Spotify that data set. Yeah, so there's there's a term um, called churn. Churn basically means how often people leave or how often something changes. Here's the difference between a large playlist and a smaller independent playlist, Okay. A large playlist that is handled, for instance, by Spotify's AI or uh, a huge curator or something, they have to literally change, like New Music Friday. It's different. Every, you get on there once a day. Like what you get on there for one day. There's a lot of listeners on New Music Friday, but there is one day for it that you're on there. So yeah, now you have a suddenly 140, 150, you know, 200,000 monthly listeners. That all goes away next month, except for the small percentage who decided to follow you. Now you're on a smaller playlist, independently run. You know the curator. You know, you've gotten on a call with him or her, you know, talked about, you know, crazy, you know, childhood stories. You both saved one of your friends who was blackout drunk at a barbecue. What are the odds? You know, now your friends puts you on there, keeps you on there all month, couple months. You're just racking those up and people grow accustomed to you. You know, now all of a sudden they're going to your page. Oh, they look pretty cool. They look nice. What's their Instagram? Oh, now they're reaching out to you on Instagram. Now they can learn about your shows or whatever. Do that with a bunch of different playlisters and a bunch of different songs. It's very powerful. And the official playlist will pick you up. Also, another thing is like, there's a lot of official playlists that don't have many listeners. They're not the end all be all. Like I, we've been on like H and M's in-store playlist did 
miles more than um, the indie pop chill. <laughs> and you got to realize a lot of these independent playlisters, people aren't reaching out to them all the time or like kissing their ass or actually wanting to make a personal connection. Don't use them. But if you do find them interesting and like you admire what they've done and what they've built because they do work hard, it's not a bad idea to see if you can like set up a call or like pay for a consultation. Hey, what would provide you the most value for your playlist? What helps the most? You know, what are you what trends are you seeing? I guarantee you the vast majority of them will just be so complimented. They'll be like, no, like, let's just get on a call. It's chill. Even if you just call someone up and say, yo, what are you looking for? That's going to give you like a lot more respect yeah. instead of just the guy that's like, hey man, I have a new song. Can you add it? Yeah. You know, or <laughs> here's something crazy. One of my friends who's in PR, she literally just straight up bought like four or five playlists. You know, she saved up for a while, but like she straight up just bought a few playlists and she can put her music and her artist stuff at the top all the time. So she can push her stuff. But, you know, they have tens of thousands of listeners combined. I think she bought it for like a couple grand. And um, she puts her her artist stuff always at the top. And then, you know, basically it's kind of like payola with some other artists. Like they'll give her like 20 bucks or whatever for the month. Um, and then if she believes in them, she'll just like start keeping them on. And so, yeah, she owns some playlists and it's fucking badass. So she owns that territory. Why can't you just go ahead and buy somebody's playlist? Like... <laughs> Like maybe, they, maybe the curator doesn't even want to run it anymore. Right. That's totally a thing. If you're like a, like a sad indie rock artist, why don't you find some struggling 400 follower indie rock playlist? Yeah. Buy it and then put your stuff on it. Yeah. It's dope. <laughs> like why not? <laughs> so that's the thing. Like the possibilities are endless with this stuff, man. Like if you kind of just like train yourself to always kind of look at, what's going on on the edges yeah. you figure out there's a lot of opportunity on the edges and that kind of gets you closer to where you want to be. If there is ever a time to kill some sacred cows, it is 100% now. Bro. Yeah. Just because you feel like, Oh, well that's like cheating to, you know, <laughs> try to have a playlist and like promote myself. It's like, well, yeah. Show me an artist that one didn't give equity away or two never invested in somebody else taking them on and three never invested in their audience and got huge. Like I would, I would love to know because I, I haven't, I haven't found that. I want to make it very clear. There's a lot of people that shouldn't do music full time, but you know, if you do choose that route, um, then understand it is a business. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. Like some of the most creative, coolest people I've ever met are business minds in music or musicians with business minds. But if you want to keep it a hobby, that's totally cool, you know? Um, but there isn't something unethical about like investing in your career or investing in relations or whatever. You just kind of have to pick, is it okay being a hobby? And if it is, that's totally cool. If you want it to be your job, well then, you know, you treat it as a job. Like that's totally cool. Either is totally badass. And there's some people that I know, my buddy, Kyle, Kyle Jones, awesome bassist, lives down the street from me. And he's one of my favorite bassists, funniest dudes ever. And he works in insurance. And I got to tell you, he is the happiest dude I know. He loves having that split in life where like plays bass, also sells insurance. And like, he's totally, he's just a happy dude. I'm doing this full time because like, I've never had another job, but like, I'm pretty positive. I would be pretty miserable doing something else. But if something else makes me happier, then I would do that. You know, but this makes me really happy. So that's why I do it. Well, Mark, thanks for hanging out with us today. Give us a little insights. I learned a lot. So hopefully other people do too. Any place we can connect with you more or any anything you want to share with us? So yeah, you can go to my site. It's markeckert.com. Uh, you can get the release strategy ebook for free. You can get 100 Spotify playlists or downloads in an Excel sheet for free. Um, I send out a bunch of stuff about the industry pretty often. Um, just trying to help out as much as I can. Cause I know it can be kind of confusing. Um, and then, uh, I also run that pitch.com. Yeah. We just place a bunch of music in a lot of tech companies, um, you know, in their apps, or maybe if they're buying up catalogs, place a bunch of, uh, sync licensing for ads, etc. So sweet dude. Well, thanks for hanging out, dude. Yeah, man. 
So that's it for my conversation today with Mark Eckert. Just quick before we go, wanted to remind you about our free workshop, Rock the Release. Going to teach you a proven plan for promoting your music for maximum success, getting on blogs, playlists, all of that. Just go to evergreenrecords.com to sign up. But for now, that's it, and we will see you next time.